Revolution Radio proudly presents, live from the heart of the Blue Ridge, Roanoke, Virginia, it's the Just Bernard Show with host Bernard Alvarez. Join Bernard as he shares topics that reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience, including world liberty, the esoteric, suppressed technologies, spiritual ascension, and human consciousness. Humanity has awakened, and our time has come to realize our full potential. And now, live from the Star City, your host, Bernard Alvarez. Anyway, so let me tell you a little bit about my guest who's joining me today. Uh, Dr. Rita Louise is a best-selling author. Uh, she's the host of the Just Energy Radio and the founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics. She is the author of the book, Stepping Out of Eden, The E.T. Chronicles, What Myth and Legend Has to Say About Human Origin, Avoiding the Cosmic 2x4, Dark Angels, An Insider's Guide to Ghost Spirits, and attached entities and power within as well as hundreds of articles that have been published worldwide she is also the producer of a number of feature length and video shorts uh, dr rita has appeared on radio and television and has spoken at conferences covering topics such as health healing ghosts intuition ancient mysteries and the paranormal which is what we all love so welcome to the show dr rita thanks for coming today thanks for having me bernard it's great to be back Yes, God, I think you were on the last time was probably 2011 or 2012. <laughs> you know, that's what people keep saying, and I'm like, okay. Can you believe? <laughs> I, I can't, we both have been doing this this long. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, speaking of why did we start doing this? <laughs> let me, um, let's start by, um, I, since there have been so many, uh, it's been so many years and it's been such a while, maybe. Uh, you wouldn't mind refreshing our memories a little bit and telling us a little bit about how you got involved uh, in this type of work. Uh, you, like myself, you've been doing this for quite a long time. And uh, what inspired you to write this new book? Because it's a really interesting topic. Well, you know, you, you sit there and you look at your story and, you know, it doesn't really change. But then you like find new things to add in. So now I'm just going to blame it all on my mom. <laughs> How's that? There you go. So, That's what everybody does anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I grew up in a household where we were like a science, a sci-fi household. You know, my mom was, I mean, she's a total trekkie and we would watch, you know, like creature features and, you know, outer limits and one step beyond and, you know, shows like the prisoner and and that was what we watched on TV. You know, if it was available, that's what we were watching. And so I grew up, you know, with there being, I'll say, permission to have kind of an alternative view of the world and of life. And, um, you know, I've had two loves in my life, not personal loves, but, you know, work loves. Mm -hmm. And one was studying old stuff, you know, and so my first love was the study of archaeology and anthropology and um, and had basically worked my way through those departments at the library by the time I was like 11 years old and went to Catholic school, which really didn't fly real well with the nuns. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then I found out about the concept of ESP, better known as psychic abilities today, and really immersed myself in that study. And then probably about 2009, there was a lot more shows coming out on TV about alternative history, alternative archaeology, uh, the very beginning of the ancient alien phenomena really breaking through. And I revisited that topic and, you know, went back to really my first love in life is, which is studying old stuff. Um, I joke around that I'm the person that likes reading, you know, those boring, dry books that sit on a shelf that nobody wants to touch because they're boring and dry. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of stuff I like reading, like 
today, and actually I have these papers sitting on my desk and I, oh, wrong pile. Um, you know, but I just, I'm, I'm starting a new article. I mean, because one of the things I've been exploring has been uh, genetic engineering, and mm -hmm. I find it pretty rampant in the plant kingdom. So I've been doing uh, some research on um, cotton and coffee and some other plants that font you find anomalous genetics but you know you find these articles and they're talking about stuff that i don't even know what they're talking about because they're these scientific super notated articles and you know but i like reading stuff like that yeah it's kind of weird so well you're feeding your brain <laughs> i know I, i'm surprised it hasn't exploded yet <laughs> <laughs> You know, I can, I can relate to what you're saying. I remember reading books that I had no clue what they were talking about, but I, I kept saying if I keep putting the information into my head, eventually it'll make sense. And little bit, little by little, a little piece here and a little piece there, it starts to make sense. You get that aha moment, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I remember, I mean, this was years ago, but I was an adult and uh, was in L.A. and realized that the La Brea tar pit that I had read about in book after book after book as a little kid was actually in downtown LA, like yeah. downtown next door to the museum of modern art, downtown LA. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I have to go there. I have to go check this place out. And it's like, okay, well, you're kind of a geek. <laughs> <laughs> A very cool one. But. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> now, Dr. Rhea, did you yourself um, have any, like, paranormal experiences or anything that uh, kind of, like, pushed you in this direction to start studying this work? Um, I mean, there was my fascination with the whole concept of psychic abilities and had wanted to uh, be psychic or learn to be psychic and studied it for a gajillion years and finally found the Berkeley Psychic Institute and found out after being in their program for about three weeks that I had been very psychic my whole life. And no one ever said that if you pick up your Christmas gift and go, oh, well, it's either this or this, and it's one of the things that you think it's going to be, and then you open another gift and it's the other item you think it might be. You know, uh, no one ever said, oh, but that's a psychic thing. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it was like, oh. But growing up, I actually grew up in a haunted house. So there was the dead guy that lived in the base in the basement. And then I left there and went to college and lived in a house that was very active. Um, and after, you know, it's always these things, you know, you find out after you're already committed. Um, so after I moved in, signed a lease, all this stuff, I found out that the house had been the old funeral parlor. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> You know, but see, this was before I liked ghosts because, you know, we had the dead guy that lived in the basement. I was really kind of scared. Um, yeah, so I move into this really active house. Like, yay. <laughs> and I can't move out. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you just signed the lease, of course. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So um, as far as um, getting involved in and in being inspired to write this particular book, Stepping Out of Eden, I mean, this is, uh, this is a very, for me, it's a very big deal because it's something that I have felt, uh, well, since the beginning. I never quite, you know, I never quite believed in the Bible story, but then I knew there was a little more to the evolution story. And I believe I was reading an article uh, in the Green Egg. I don't know if you all remember that magazine from the 70s and 80s. It was an old pagan magazine. And it talked about how um, hallucinogenics were a part of the evolutionary process and how perhaps there were spiritual beings that helped us, you know, like transdimensional entities to help us evolve. So, you know, your book, Stepping Out of Eden, is pretty much a, 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 a knack or a knock on that, you know, that particular door of, okay, there is an alternative uh, way of looking at uh, our human origins. So what was it that kind of pushed you? Or was it just like that big aha moment? Did you just say, okay, there's got to be something else here? What was it for you? Well, 
You know, probably the last time I was on was when I released the E.T. Chronicles book, mm -hmm. which when we were talking, it was the original title was Man Made the Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods. And so it was picked up by a publisher and they changed the name. And um, and so that book looked at our history based on the mythic record. And so it starts at in the beginning and it goes to the rise of civilization about 3,200 years ago. Um, and so, and humanity in the book is really at the end of the story. It's the second to last chapter where we find narratives about the creation of man. But I didn't really delve into humanity moving from this creation quote unquote event into how we became the people that we are. I mean, because if you look at it from an evolutionary model, you know, there's the physiological changes, but we're more than just a body. You know, there is this whole level of culture and society and our belief systems and morals and our reverence to a, a god or gods that you know, we, you don't find that in the animal kingdom. I mean, I don't think, I don't think, you know, dogs and cats believe in God, you know, so there right. is this whole other level to who we are. And I really wanted to explore that because we really can't understand our place in this whole system of things until we really look at the human experience and where that came from. Here, here, absolutely. You know, I, I like that uh, in your books, you, you rely a lot on myth mythical, quote unquote, mythical records, uh, you know, and the reality of it is, is that, well, when I got into this journey, one of the first, one of my heroes, uh, and I'm using the word appropriately hero, was uh, uh, Joseph Campbell. And uh, he really covered a lot of mythology, but the way that he spoke of it, he said, well, you know, while they may be uh, symbols or analogies of human behavior and human uh, evolution or culture or societies, uh, there may be some truth in them. And I've always felt, you know, at, up until that point growing up, it was like, okay, well, these are all just fairy tales. And that's what we're trained to believe, that they're all, except for the Bible, depending on where you go to school. Uh, you know, everything is a fairy tale except for the Bible, you know. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be that place, that happy medium of, okay, is some of it based in truth? And, you know, are, are these just made up stories or is there some historical accuracy to that? Well, and, and I would love to find the person who came out and said that these stories are figments of our imagination or they're archetyp archetypal narratives to help explain our place in the universe or to explain, you know, natural phenomena. Because if you just kind of put that, you know, when we watch some horror movie or science fiction movie or whatever, we're able to take our current reality and put it to the side and just be part of this story, bizarre as it may be. Um, and so what if we can do that and take what our beliefs are and say, well, what does myth say? And is it possible that what they say is true? And what I found interesting is, you know, I don't rely completely on myth. I take the myth and then look for cor correlating uh, evidence that we find in the archaeological record, you know, from scientific annals that support the stories that we find in myth, you know, moving through time. You know, I think, um, you know, 150 years ago, what we see in the mythic record, you know, the the uh, flying machines of the gods and their magnificent weapons and the things that they could do um, were science fiction because yeah. we were unable to do that. But when you look at it from a technological point of view, someplace that we're at at this point in time what they talk about in these stories seem very cogent, you know, and especially, and I know we're going to get into this, but I'm just going to make a quick reference and, and stop, um, you know, about the potential genetic engineering of humanity as a species. I mean, today, you know, we have cloning, we have, you know, like Frankenfish where they take 
the DNA from an eel and mix it in with a salmon. And so now we have this hybrid GMO thing happening, um, which they talk about in the mythic record. And it's a, it's a reality today. You know, that's a very, very interesting and actually a very similar way that I look at it in the sense that, I mean, just like you said, it seems that, well, let me let me recapture my thought here. I forgot who said, I, I think it was actually Aleister Crowley, <laughs> who said that magic is merely technology that hasn't been discovered yet. And I can't help but feel that perhaps a lot of these people that were writing down and taking record, uh, you know, taking notes or whatever of history, uh, were doing their best to explain what they were seeing, but and it made it sound fantastical. I mean, you look at the old... Uh, uh, the monks and how they saw you know, like the Aztec doing ceremony and whatnot, and they thought they were worshiping the devil and all this stuff. I mean, just so much misunderstanding. And then we have, uh, for example, the flying machines that are seen on the walls of you know of ancient Egypt, you know, from thousands of years ago, that look like flying machines. I mean, I don't know, but <laughs> they look like UFOs to me. <laughs> well, I mean, there, you know, and I talk about this in the book, there was the cargo cult. And I know that they talk about the cargo cult, you know, in a lot of, you know, like ancient alien type shows, you know, but basically it was an indigenous culture in uh, like Southeast Asia and uh, they lived on an island. And so during World War II, the Americans came and set up military bases. And so they were constantly dropping supplies down to this base. And so the natives were like, these are gods. Look, they have chocolate and Coca-Cola and these riches and wonders. I mean, because they had bows and arrows. Maybe they, maybe a little agriculture. You know, I mean, they were indigenous. And they saw all of this stuff as these wonders from the gods. And when the war was over and the Americans left this base... It's like, well, all the supply stopped and they didn't know what happened. They didn't understand why they're not getting these riches from the gods. And so they constructed these, you know, wooden airplane looking things and they made runways and they made towers and they had little wooden headsets and a guy would go out on the runway and do his magical arm signal, you know, ritual right. to guide the plane in because that's how you call the gods in. This is the ritual you do in order to have these magnificent airships come in. Well, obviously it didn't work, but yeah. to them it was magic. To us, it was they were dropping supplies. Yeah. You know, so it's really just a very different perspective. Actually, yeah, very much so, very much so. And so going to the, well, to the topic at hand, um, many years ago, I watched a video. Um, I forgot what organization it was. Uh, it was a, it was like a little 20 minute movie or whatnot. And it was very interesting. It was about intelligent design and they were showing, uh, you know, the DNA. It, they did it from a very scientific point of view and how I forgot what it was, some little amoeba or something that was the key to making the DNA work. It was like the key to the DNA. And it had like a little propeller on it. And it looked like a little machine. And he said, does this, you know, does this not look like a, a machine that was created uh, here on a microscopic level, you know, on, a, on an atomical level in order for the DNA to actually work? And I was like, you know, that's very interesting because during my shamanic vision quest, um, I was told there are three types of gods and i'm wondering if we can talk about that a little bit what are the gods uh there's the man-made god where people just think oh look at that pretty tree it has all the life underneath it it must be very special kind of like the runway you're describing you know oh this is a very magical space or whatnot it has so much life around it uh then we have you know the so-called thought forms that people just keep releasing and building up energy into the astro uh universe uh which creates uh, some kind of let's say synthetic energetic life form and then we have the quote-unquote transdimensional and that was kind of what i got out of my vision quest so you know are these transdimensional entities creating these little machines that make our dna work you know it's it is a possibility <laughs> so in, in within the scheme of what what your book is talking about what are the gods how do you approach that 
See, that's a great question. And um, I cover all that because I think it's a really vital question that um, creates a lot of controversy. And so um, actually, I'm going to start with the Western world's point of view of God. You know, when I was writing the E.T. Chronicles book, um, I try to write this panacea of thought, but what I figured out really early in writing it was that once you step outside the Western world, so the Abrahamic, you know, Judeo-Christian, mm-hmm. so Christian, Jewish, and Islam traditions that are monotheistic, pretty much every other culture believes that there are, you know, extraterrestrial beings you know, and these sky gods that exist. Um, And so there's a level of programming and a level of uh, brainwashing that we find in the Western world. And so a lot of this work is really kind of addressing that programming, which I talk about in the book, not about necessarily the Abrahamic part, but just the programming that humanity has experienced. But with that said, you know, in the Western world, we think when we think of God, we think of God as being omnipotent and timeless and can manifest anything out of nothing. You know, and I'm just going to keep that short, you know, and I like to, with my little Star Trek mind, you know, refer people to Q from Star Trek, oh, yeah. who he snaps his fingers and the mariachi band appears or he waves his arm and the Enterprise flies galaxies away. Now, that's omnipotent. Yeah, <laughs> that is truly omnipotent. Um, but when we look at the stories from myth, they don't seem that way. You know, and again, they have these magical carriages that can tra- transport them very quickly across the water or through the skies and these weapons that they use to fight each other with. And um, and so if you're omnipotent and omnipotent God, one, why will you need any of that? Okay, so that's kind of the framework. And so we do find, and and you're right, three different uh, levels of spirit. In in ancient and indigenous cultures, I mean, they are very animistic. And, you know, so you find that belief in Native American cultures. You find it in traditional, like, Hindu-type cultures, Buddhist cultures, where everything is alive, you know, and there is a spirit or a vitality within everything. You know, so the tree is alive. The tree has a soul. And, you know, if you're going to cut the tree down, you should thank it for its service, you know, because there is an energy and a dynamic that we in the Western world have been told to ignore. Um, You know, so that even though they aren't necessarily gods, there is a level of spirit inside of them. You know, when it gets into the other two areas, it gets very interesting, you know. And so, like, I don't think they're... When we're talking about the gods, I don't necessarily put them as thought forms. I feel like we have two different potential things going on. I mean, one are these gods or spirits or non-corporeal beings, you know, Mm -hmm. so, and who they are, we kind of don't really know. Um, You know, so are they ghosts? You know, I mean, they kind of fall into that category that, uh, shamans would connect with they would use the ritual experience you know so whether it was chanting and dancing and doing this whole community ritual or through the use of psychotropic uh, plants to achieve an ecstatic state in order to communicate with these non-corporeal beings which would guide them and instruct them and help them move through life and provide them with information And, um, you know, and people are still communing with those beings today, you know, so it is something there and real and rational. Are they extraterrestrial? You know, is it Fred from Zeta Reticula that we're communicating with? You know, it gets a little subjective, you know, or people that come forward with their experiences often get poo-pooed and it's not well documented. So, 
we're not we don't really know um but it seems to me that many of the things that we find in the mythic record um you know, either they're physical beings or they are trans-dimensional beings where they can leave our physical dimension and also be in our physical dimension. Because if you're just a non-corporeal being, you would not be able to interact with our genetics. You know, you would not be able to interact here on the physical world. And so there had to be, at least at points in time, a physicality to them in the three-dimensional world. You know, whether it was all the time and they were actually extraterrestrials and ships flying around, <laughs> um, or if they were transdimensional beings that maybe, you know, traveled through dimensions in a ship, you know, it, it's a little unclear, but, you know, I, I do feel pretty confident that they're, at, you know, that people did see them. People did physically interact with these people beings these people i kind of not feel human the same. yeah I, I especially when it's so prevalent and all the all of the indigenous uh cultures and belief and traditions uh like you said we always hear about the sky people and you know it well there's just so many reasons why it is a, re a realistic theory um, that's a whole other show, but or maybe this is the show to do that. <laughs> when we talk about, you know, the pyramids. How did the pyramids end up on so many continents? Uh, how did uh, so much technology get spread across in the so-called ancient world? And we could talk about, uh, I mean, if we look at the idea of these uh, civilizations that uh, collapsed uh, due to a great cataclysm and maybe um, the technology came from back then and, and was gifted to us by these uh, transdimensional or extraterrestrial entities i mean there's just there's just so much uh well so much going on in my mind but so much information <laughs> out there already that we can kind of look to 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 support what we're talking about here now with that being said what about the bible does the bible have anything that uh supports uh or have any relevance to what it is that we're talking about well you know when i was writing okay so when I was writing the E.T. Chronicles book, because it really did bring in that kind of stuff, um, what I so there were two things that I did right at the beginning. One was I took the Bible and I put it to the side. And the other thing I did was I took all of Zachariah Sitchin's work and I put it to the side because I didn't want to regurgitate Sitchin's work, but I also didn't want to write a book that either tries to prove or disprove the Bible. I wanted to take this body of information and have it be what it was going to be and take me down whatever rabbit hole or not that was going to happen. But what I found, Bernard, this was like the coolest thing. What I found was that the stories that you find in Genesis, so it's Genesis 1 through, and I don't know what the number is, but through the flood narrative, okay, which corresponds to early creation, quote unquote, myths, which is really what that book deals with, mm -hmm. were extremely congruent. Extremely. Now, I like to joke around and say, Okay, so in multiple traditions, you have more than one god. And so you can have Enki fighting Enlil and, and Zeus conquering Kronos, you know. And so because many of these ancient myths are these stories of them fighting with each other and, you know, vi vying each other for power and control. Well, in the Bible, there's only one god. So he can't really fight himself. And so if you take this narrative with a giant can of whiteout and just start getting rid of all of these stories <laughs> that talk about more than one God and the things that they're doing, then the Bible is very cogent. It's just really abbreviated from what you find in other cultures. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me right, because it's been such a long time since I've read the Bible... <laughs> Um, and when I studied the Bible, um, I actually, I wanted to rewrite the Bible at one time. I was like, oh, too much work. But anyway, <laughs> if, if everybody else can rewrite it, why can't I? But um, while I was in that phase uh, of my life and doing uh, in-depth study, 
I remember correctly, in the very beginning, uh, they did use a plural word for gods. Uh, I believe they used the word Elohim, which is a group. Mm -hmm. And I believe even in some of the English translations, they actually used the plural word gods. So it's very, you know, it's like they the, the story started off right, and then somewhere it kind of just, I guess, became monotheistic. But well, yeah. Very well, I mean, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you have, um, you know, in the Ten Commandments, you know, don't have other gods before me. Well, what other gods? Right. If there's only one God, then what other gods are there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but Ooh, I never at thought that of point, that. That's a good one. You know, but at that point in time, you know, there was the belief in Baal, who would be the uh, Enlil character, except under more of a Babylonian name, uh, who dominated, you know, religion at that point in time. You know, so it's like, mm, you know. Yeah. Don't don't look at him. Just look at me. Right, right. And well, back then, as um, as you talk about in your book, um, they were able. To, uh, a lot of them perform ritual. And uh, just give me one moment, Reed. I just got a note from the radio station. They want us to log on. Give it a try here. This is about during our commercial break, so good timing. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll edit. Oh, wrong wrong person. Sorry, Hawk. Wrong guy, sorry. <laughs> we'll edit all this out for the YouTube commercial. <laughs> I mean, the YouTube okay. video. Anyway, so those of you watching us live and those of you that are listening to us live, we are uh, streaming live on the air on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. This is the Just Bernard Show, and we are speaking with Dr. Rita Louise. And uh, Rita... Uh, we were just getting ready to talk a little bit. Of, we were talking about like Baal and the people that performed all the rituals and whatnot. And I am very much a proponent uh, to ritual work. I believe it's, uh, I like the way, again, my hero, Joseph Campbell, calls ritual the enactment of a myth. And for me, it is all, uh, for me, it's, I still perform modern ritual. And for me, it's a, a way of altering our state of consciousness to return to source, quote unquote, and then kind of bringing our consciousness back to daily waking consciousness. Uh, in your book, you talk a lot about ritual experience and why is it so important to our ancestors? Well, it was their way of connecting with the gods. So one of the things that you find out in myth is that the gods really, really, really wanted to be venerated. And they wanted to be worshipped and they wanted us or in other stories, you know, the giants or um, even in some of the very early narratives, the very early gods to be is why would we even do that? Why would we even give up our seniority to something that is potentially make believe? But anyway, well, that's a very good I point. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good point. Um, you know, but it was a way in which the, you know, the, it, it was kind of a twofold process because when you would do ritual in antiquity, it wasn't about I'm doing ritual, although I might do my own rituals, but usually it was a group activity and the whole community participated in what was going on. And so through, you know, they say that, you know, when you uh, pray in a group or you meditate in a group, it increases the vibration and it increases the intensity. So anyone who has ever done group meditation, I bet they have found that uh, when they're in a group that they can get into a deeper meditative state you know, and be a more relaxed state. And so these rituals were done in a group environment. And so, and one, it would increase the vibration and increase the frequency of the group dynamic, and then also set the stage for those individuals who were more open to moving into that ecstatic state to be supported by the community. 
You know, but as you were saying, and I'm going to just put a couple of different words here, ritual is a meditative experience. Mm -hmm. And so people that meditate find that they experience more peace in their life. They find that they're more open to the energy dynamics that are out there and existent in the world. You know, so there's a lot of benefit to doing ritual. I mean, because every aspect of the ritual was a meditative process, whether you were preparing the land for having the ritual or preparing the sacred, the sacred food, or you were grinding uh, different uh, minerals for making paint, you know, or creating a, a mask so that you could be the embodiment of the God. Um, it, they were all done as a sacred process and part of this group ritual experience mm -hmm. so that by the time they were actually doing the ritual, you know, dancing and singing and doing this whole thing, they were already primed because they have already gone through this series of meditative steps that cleared them internally so that they could connect to source. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. always was the goal was about connecting and communing with God and God with them. Yeah. At least I, I, from what we've seen, that seems to be, except for, of course, you know, the, the greedy ones that wanted the gods to have them do something for them, you know, <laughs> as we move into the patriarchy, but that's a whole nother show. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, getting to the meat and bones of, of uh, the meat and potatoes of uh, your book, uh, you're, you're, basically the book is, you're intimating that we're not the product of creation or evolution, uh, but somehow we are engineered or, you know, somewhere in between. Uh, what what did you mean by that? Did extraterrestrials mold us into who we are today? I mean, that seems based on the mythic record to be the case. Um, you know, in creationist thought, so Christian creationist thought, their belief is that God created us, period. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So when you look at the mythic record, what you see in story after story after story is the gods created us, period. Um, you know, and really the only difference between creationists and people that are ancient alien people that believe that the that extraterrestrials came and manipulated our G DNA is your definition of who and what God is. You know, Very where much. Christians believe that it's the omnipotent creator God, you know, and ancient alien people believe it's these gods with this high technology. And so when you look at creation of mankind stories, um, you find basically two themes that run through them. One is that humanity was made out of clay or mud, dust of the earth material you know or some kind of material carbon. and or <laughs> you don't find carbon uh in um the popol vuh uh humanity is ultimately made out of corn mm. um red white yellow and black which i found very interesting um and then the other narrative that you find is that humanity is made out of some piece of genetic material the blood of a god the bone of one of the ancestors aka the giants um this saliva you know yeah. they spit into the bowl um and so they're you know in the bible you know eve is made out of the rib of adam but adam is made out of out of the dust of the earth so you actually find both pieces of the story in the biblical narrative, yeah. you know, both the mud or the dirt and the genetic part. Um, you know, and it's interesting because there are some cultures that just have one piece and there are some cultures that just have the other piece. And then you have some cultures that actually have both the, like the Bible story, the clay slash mud and the genetic inference. The other major thing that you find is that there are, a number of stories that talk about 
multiple attempts at humanity being created. So in the Sumerian text, uh, they talk about six or seven different attempts at making humanity. Um, you know, one of them couldn't walk upright. One of them couldn't hold its urine. One of them uh, wasn't able to uh, bear children. And so they make another attempt. Um, in the Popol Vuh, I mentioned that the final product of humanity was made out of corn, but there was one that was made out of mud. And when it rained, they melted. And then there were ones that were made out of wood, but they turned out to be stupid and they didn't worship. See, here we get that worship. They didn't mm. worship the gods in the way they wanted. And so they got rid of them with the final attempt of humanity being made out of corn. And I'm going to say again, red, yellow, black, red, yellow, black, white, white. I knew there was a mic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of the elements, the Native American elements. That's why. <laughs> well, but what's interesting is, you know, when we look at the look at the races of humanity, what do we have? Yeah. Red, yellow, black, you know, pretty much You're black right. and white, you know. So I, I found I when I read that the first time, I was like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so there are obviously many uh, cultures and many beliefs and mythologies that, that indicate that something created us. They all do. There's not one story about a slow and gradual process uh, <laughs> of us coming out of something else. None of them. Now, there are stories, however, um, and, and it's not as much tied to humanity, but other things, uh, but it easily could be tied to humanity, um, where they have, you know, and I'm going to say ex explicit genetic engineering happening. You know, uh, Brosis, uh, who's a Babylonian priest, uh, talks about, you know, in the underworld where they had all kinds of beasts, you know, and it had the head of this animal and the body of this animal. I mean, these true chimera type yeah creatures you know I, and i would you know just kind of for our awareness you know like centaurs and pans but you know what he was actually referring to um who knows you know but i would assume that his writing is based off of information that he had acquired from a much earlier point in time but he's not the only one that makes those kind of references either very, very interesting. Now, Rita, we're, we're coming up. We got about five minutes left, if that. So I have to get to the million dollar question. And okay. it's very interesting because I just started rewatching the series V, <laughs> the mm -hmm. uh, 2009 version. And I was like, you know, this is a really and I'm and now I heard they're going to make a whole new trilogy out of that movie, uh, a major motion picture out of that series. So I'm like, OK, why does this? stories stick with us you know why is it so you know are the, are we food you know what's going on so what why if we were uh, if the ets did mess with our or manipulate our dna um and and i don't want to go into the subtleties of you know neanderthal man versus homo sapien mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh if they did why did they mess with us are they are they trying to help us or are they trying to breed us or what did you discover in in your research well, you know, <laughs> mythology tends to be beyond silent on uh, the why. You know, we just are the remnant. And so there are people who have theorized the why part. Um, to me, based on uh, a, a lot of different pieces of inform information, my feeling is, is that we were created as a domestic animal um, with and then trained uh, to have higher function, to be able to interact with humanity. You know, so whether we were servants, you know, like when we think of horses, horses are domestic animals, mm -hmm. you know, domestic animals of labor. You know, so we don't eat horses. The same with camels. I mean, I guess they eat camels, but, you know, but for the most part, you know, they're used as Pets. animals of labor. 
and pets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it kind of left me with the feeling like we were like the little pet monkey, you know, <laughs> they give us a little organ grinder thing and we're going to entertain everybody. Um, but it seems like a lot of the engineering that happened was very specific to take us from one place to another, which would allow us to interact with the gods easier, especially when it comes to our bipedalism and our ability to communicate because there have been a lot of changes to our vocal system, mm -hmm. you know, and our ability to use and have language because language requires us to be able to cognate, you know, if I say cow, there's a mental image of this is what a cow is. You know, so it takes us out of the I'm in the world and interacting it in a here and now place to be able to be more reflective and recall images of items. And so animals don't have that. You know, that is a trait that is uniquely human. Um, yeah. OK, so with that said, you know, there are two major theories that are out there, you know, and one this is where I kind of bring that Zachariah Sitchin part in. You know, his theory is that we were created as a slave species, which I don't like that word. Right. Um, you know, and his, his thought was that we were here to mine the gold. But myth does not support that at all, at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so again, why they created us. You know how you were talking about in, you know, with these prayers, it's like we're begging God, you know, like, hey, you know, make it rain, help, help my family. But in all of the narratives that come down from when humanity took over the mythic narrative, and that's a whole other show right there. Uh, <laughs> well, so just take my word for that. OK, um, there aren't any prayers for. You're having us mine the gold and we don't want to do it anymore. I mean, there's not anything about this labor or burden that they want taken off of us. So either it was so far back in our history that it hasn't survived, but it also hasn't survived in our mythic history. You know, so yeah. it, it's weird that way. That the other option, which is kind of creepy, but kind of works, is the whole... David Icke kind of thought where we were created as a food source, yeah. you know, and I joke around, not that, you know, they're going to cook us and we're going to taste like chicken kind of food source, but that they created us as an energetic food yes. source, more like the matrix yep. kind of, or, and this is going to sound like a weird parallel, but you remember that movie monsters, the cartoon, yeah. you know, and they, go and they open the door to the little kid's bedroom and they would yell and scare the kid and they would collect all of the fear yep. into bottles and they would use that to supply the city. And so, you know, that kind of David Ikean belief line is that they put us into situations and submissive situations so that they could control our energy and create these fear-based narratives so that they could feed off of that fear-based energy from us, which would sustain them, which and is a very scary thought. It's a very scary thought. And you know what? That's one that I, I speak of often. <laughs> God, uh, back uh, many, many years ago, probably back when you were on the first time, we had John Trudell on the show, and he said the same thing. He said these, this idea of these elites, you know, wanting this or that, he goes, they're feeding off of our fear. He goes, that's what they want. They create these, these situations to invoke fear, and then we go down to that level and that low vibration, and these, you know, these awful entities or whatever you want to call them are feeding off of it. And I say that well, all the time. We're never going to evolve if we keep if we keep giving them our fear. They're, you know, back to that paradigm of uh, or that analogy of the V thing. I mean, I'm seeing it now on on V, and it's like, it's funny how they use the same symbols that David Icke uses with the reptilians and whatnot. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, I think we have about one more minute. I just want to throw this out there uh, for a fourth or alternative version: is what if we're the gods and we just needed to create a vessel so we could play in this uh, into this the dimension in this human dimension? 
So there's another another theory to throw everybody for a loop. I think, yeah, I think in that people just need to like meditate on that one. <laughs> anyway, we're, we are back down to about one minute, Rita. And I was wondering if you could tell us real quick, where can people find Stepping Out of Eden? I mean, the best place they can go is to my website, soulhealer.com, S-O-U-L-H-E-A-L-E-R.com. Um, it's available there as well as my last book, uh, E.T. Chronicles, uh, What Myth and Legends Have to Say About Human Origin or Man Made the Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods, both titles, same book. The older one has a better cover and spelling and grammatical mistakes. It's still available. Um <laughs> I mean, if you can get them at your, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. If you get them from me, they come autographed, ah, which is better. way better. Um, you know, and if you're really interested in this topic, I would really recommend getting both books. Not trying to push both books, but they really work hand in hand with each other. Right, they complement each other absolutely. And uh, tell us about tell us about. Are you still doing just energy radio? Um, I'm not, although I keep. You know, I really listen to what spirit says to me, okay. and they've been kind of bugging me to start again. Oh, okay. But your so, archives are still out and about, and people can still yes, find them. Yes, the archives are still out there and available, you know, and so it's sitting back there, but I have not acted on it yet. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Life takes over sometimes. It's so funny. I... Uh, the other day, I received royalties from Blog Talk Radio. I was like, I haven't been on Blog Talk in like six years. I was like, oops, that's still there, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Rita, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure. What a great discussion. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I just want to let everybody know, remind everybody that uh, you can find Rita's book at her website at soulhealer.com. <laughs> And that next week, I'll be doing my live q and I didn't get to do it last week, so I owe you one. We're going to do a live discussion. Give me your questions, and I'll answer them live here on the radio and on my Facebook page. Have a great week, everyone. I love you. Bye-bye.